And while we're praising him, hallelujah, it's good. You can be seated in the house of the Lord. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate every one of you coming tonight. You guys will push that button up there, HDMI 1 or 2, I think it's 2, and get there we go. Hallelujah. All right. Welcome to our midweek refueling station. Aren't you glad to get a tank full in the middle of the week? Praise the Lord. I hope you're doing as I'm doing and praying that God will continue to grow our Wednesday night group. And it is growing. We see a lot more in here tonight than there were last week. And I'm thankful, very thankful for that. I know we've had a lot of sickness and a lot of weather conditions. Jimmy, will you look over there where it says pastor and pull me down just about two notches, just about two smidge that's good right there I'm vibrating myself up here so it's all good I don't want to bust anybody's ears tonight and I might get just a little excited in a couple of points here because this is some good stuff and I'm very thankful to be able to be what God's called me to be here tonight let's let's once again I don't believe we can get too much prayer tonight I I really depend on the Lord and and uh, I have to have him. I don't know about you. You guys might be able to do what you do without him. But I can't. I'm, I'm not qualified to do what I'm doing tonight. I, I promise you. I'm over my pay, my pay grade. <laughs> this, is, this, is deeper, this is deeper than what I ever thought that I would be. But it's because of him. And I really, really depend on him and trust him. Not in myself, but in that anointing that you've placed upon my shoulders and in my life. And I stand in that anointing tonight in the power and the authority of the Word of God and the anointing that goes forth from this Word to touch your people. I ask you to use us once again for your glory. I pray for every person that's listening tonight. I pray for our Facebook friends this evening. And God, I'm asking you to touch each of them. I know that we have several that couldn't be here because of whatever. And I'm asking you, those that are watching on Facebook, that you would touch them. And whenever this message is listened to, God, I pray that it will prompt the Spirit and do what it needs to do in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, these messages are not mistakes, but they are called by you and ordered and directed by you. And I'm asking you to use me, your servant, once again, and I'll praise you and appreciate you for all that you do in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. This is the second in our series on L-U-I. Not D-U-I, but L-U-I. And everybody, I guess, knows what D-U-I is, driving under the influence. And you're probably, before I get done with this series, or before the Lord says it's done, you're probably going to get tired of hearing about being under the influence. But if there's ever been a time that you and I need to be living under the influence, it's right now. We need to be influenced by the Spirit of God in everything that we do. If we're parents, if we're grandparents, if we go to the grocery store, if we're trying to raise a kid, if we're trying to teach anybody anything, if we're trying to live life today, we need to be under the power of the influence of the Spirit of God. And the Bible says that the Lord wants to live in our hearts. And if He lives in our hearts, then He's looking for us to allow Him 
to influence us. And that's what this is basically all about. I'm going to read you again the, the, uh, the Webster's Dictionary meaning of the word influence, just in case that you don't know what that is. And then we're going to get back into the message again. And this is influence number two, living under the influence number two. And tonight we're going to be talking about becoming a great disciple. Becoming a great disciple. All of us should have that desire within our heart, no matter how old or how young that we are, we should have the desire to be a great disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, Brother Dale, what is a disciple? I'm not sure that I can be a Peter, James, or John. I'm not sure I can do that. That is much more in detail than just Peter, James, or John. The being a disciple is simply a follower of Jesus Christ, a a follower, a devout follower of the Lord, wanting to do what He wants us to do. Influence means the capacity to have an effect on the character, the development, or the behavior of someone or something, or the effect itself. As Christians, we're called to live under the influence of the Holy Spirit constantly. We are to walk in the Spirit so that we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And as we live under the influence, we will in turn influence other people. I want us to go on a journey for a few weeks and see how the Lord influenced His disciples and how they in turn influenced the people that were around them. We're starting in Ephesians again. That's kind of our... Uh, base scripture that we're going to spring from on each of these messages. I believe that's what the Lord wants us to do. And probably it'd be good for you to to, uh, memorize those scriptures because it's very good for us to understand what the scripture is saying. And the more that we read it to ourselves, the more we think about it, the more it gets down into our spirit. Therefore, don't be foolish or don't be unwise But understand what the will of the Lord is. And many people, I can't tell you over the years how many people have come to me and said, Brother Dale, I don't know how to understand what the will of the Lord is. Here is a very good way of understanding the will of the Lord. Just get in and let God do what God does best, and that's to get you and I under the influence. If you start drinking alcohol... And all I can do is talk about what I've seen. I've never been drunk. I've never drunk alcohol. I had a guy convince me one time to take a few sips of a, of a beer, and that was the nastiest stuff. I thought he had poured horse pee in a can and, and wanted me to drink it. It's the nastiest stuff I ever put in my mouth. I spewed it out, and I've never had another again. I was on a mission trip one time with somebody that I'm not going to mention their name because you'd know who it was. And we had to go to a marriage, and we were there at a marriage, and they brought out a fermented drink, and they expected us to drink it. And, you know, the Word of God talks about how when you're in Rome, you do the things. Of, I didn't want to offend anybody, and I brought that thing up to my mouth, and I got it as close as my nose. <laughs> And I had to fake a drink. I just had to fake it. That's about as far as I could get. I cannot stand it. But when people start drinking alcohol, it does something to them. It's an influencing drug. It does something to the mind. And I can get deeper into that one of these days, and I might in one of these lessons because I've done some studying on it, but when a person drinks alcohol, many, many times they do that because they want to alter the way they think or they want to alter the way that they feel. They either want to be calm or they want to be cool and, and drink with people around them. They want to make a different kind of a, of a presentation other than what they normally do. But most of the time when people drink alcohol and get under the influence of that drug, they become something different than what they were. Can you say amen? Have you ever heard an old drunk just get plum slurry in, in their talk? I'm just not sure what's going on around here. Say, Brother Dale, are you sure you hadn't been drunk? No, I've never been, I've never been drunk. I've never done that. 
But listen to me now. I'm going somewhere. We can be funny at times, can't we? The Lord's got a sense of humor. Look over at your neighbor. He does. He really, really does. But listen to me. When we are under the anointing of the Spirit, it will change the way we act. It will change the way we talk. It will change the way we walk. Alcohol causes you to stumble. The Holy Spirit causes you to be your footsteps ordered by the Lord. You walk on holy ground. You do things that God has laid out for you to do. I want to spend 24-7 under the influence of the Holy Spirit. How do I get that? I drink more and more and more of living water. How do I drink more of the living water? Jesus said, come. Whosoever will, let him drink. Whosoever will, let him come. You don't have to be thirsty. You can come and drink of the Lord. And so that's what I want us to do. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The Lord wants you drunk on the new wine, under the influence of the new wine. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. That means a downward spiral. That means all kinds of evil things. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and in hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's what we've been doing tonight. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So as we study the 12 disciples, I believe that you and I will discover at least one of them that is very much like us. Or we could say that we would probably be similar to the way the actions and the attitudes of that one particular disciple. They're average. We talked about that Sunday. They're average, ordinary people just like you and me, whom God uses to do extraordinary things. They have good days of faith and bad days of faltering. Can anybody say amen? So as we study these disciples, be sure and look for the one that's most like you. Peter is always named first in the list of the 12 disciples. He is without doubt the most prominent of Jesus' 12 ordinary disciples original disciples. Peter lived in Capernaum on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee where he and his brother Andrew were partners in a fishing business. Like the other disciples, he was unlearned or uneducated. I've had some of you guys come to me and tell me I don't have the smarts to be able to do that. It's not about your smarts. It's about your ability to yield to the Holy Spirit. If you ever have time to listen to a great story, go talk to Brother Bobby Brown sitting right over here, and he can tell you how God talks to you and gives you instructions. He's got a really good testimony that he can tell you about. So like the other disciples, Peter was unlearned or uneducated by the standards of his day. We know that he was married. Peter was married because the Gospels mention his mother-in-law. In Matthew 8, 14, Mark 1 and 30, and in Luke chapter 4, verse number 38, Peter had his faults, but he was a great disciple. Can I hear an amen? By looking at his life, and that's who we're going to be looking at tonight, the life of Peter, we're going to learn, I believe, before we get through, three things that we must do to become a great disciple. Three things that I've centered in and found in the, in the life of Peter and in the testimony of Peter that I believe you and I can learn from and can become better people, better disciples if we apply these principles. The first one, without holding back any longer, let's jump right in the middle of it. The first thing that I believe that we need to do if we're called of God and if we're doing what God's called us to do is I believe we need to leave any nets behind. We need to leave the nets behind. When Peter is first mentioned in the New Testament, he's called Simon and is in Bethany of Judea. He's in Bethany of Judea. He and his brother Andrew are there because they're followers of John the Baptist. 
And that is where John is baptizing. Pull me down just a little more, Jimmy. We just, just another hair or two there, and I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. Andrew tells his brother Simon that he has found the Messiah, and he brings Simon to Jesus. Now remember, Simon and Peter are the same individual. You'll get that before we get through it here. Let's find this in John chapter 1, verses 35 through verse number 42. Again the next day, John stood. Now this is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is baptizing back then. This is before Jesus is baptized. Are you with me so far? John the Baptist is here. He's baptizing. Jesus has been walking around many towns, and he's got great crowds that are following him, but he's not yet chosen his disciples. Now, in some places, it talks about these crowds of being many disciples, but he's not selected the disciples that are are going to become apostles. Are you with me? There are disciples and then there are apostles. And in the disciples, there are the chosen circle. We'll get into that too. I can't get ahead of myself. Again the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. This is John speaking. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned And seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek, or what are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated, Teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Are you with me so far? Let's go to verse 41. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah, but you're going to be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. So let's back up here just a little bit to the first part of verse 42 and let's look at that first phrase. What happened when Simon got brought to Jesus? Andrew brought Simon to Jesus. If there's anything that ought to be an encouragement to the church is this ought to tell us that if we indeed are going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, we ought to go get somebody. In this case, he went and got his brother. In this case, he went and got part of his family, and he said, hey, I found the Christ. If any of you found the Christ, any of you folks on Facebook, have you found the Lord? Have you told anybody about who you found? You see, it's time for us to grow the church. Are you listening to me? My job is not to go out and pull people in. I'm called here to pastor people. I will do that, and I want to do that, and I am doing that, going out and pulling them in. But primarily, it's the body of Christ, the church, the disciples that are called to reproduce themselves. Are you with me? It's our duty to reproduce ourselves. If we are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to go find somebody that is needing God. I'm not telling you to go knock on somebody's door that goes to church somewhere else and say, hey, will you come to my church? We need to find people that are not in church and get them to come to our church, to this church, to this body of fellowship where we come and let the Lord get a hold of them When they get here, when Andrew got Simon in the presence of the Lord, he didn't have to do nothing else. The Lord took over. That ought to tell us something. When we get people into the presence of the Lord, have you ever noticed there are some people, they hit and miss. They come here maybe once a month, maybe once every two months, But have you ever noticed when they get into the house, they're in the altar before they leave? 
Have you ever noticed that? That is such a blessing to me. You say, Brother Dale, why can't we get them here every service? I don't know. That's up to the Holy Spirit and them. But one thing I do know, that is a great indicator that the Spirit of the Lord is moving in this house because they wouldn't just come to the altar when they came. They'd find a way not to come to the altar. But when they come, if they're tender in their spirit, Jesus is going to get a hold of them. Peter was tender in his spirit. He came from Andrew's bidding and when he got there, he came to Jesus and Jesus gave him a new name. Woo! Anybody needing a new name? My goodness, the Lord's good to us. So let's go on. Cephas is the Aramaic word for rock. And Peter, Petros, is the Greek word for rock. So if you ever wondered how that got connected, the dots are coming together tonight. Are you with me? So the names are used interchangeably. Jesus knew Peter would become a pillar and a foundation of the church, according to Galatians 2 and 9, Ephesians 2 and 20. Jesus also knew when he changed Simon's name to Peter, there would be times when the rock of Peter would crumble. Sometime after giving Peter his new name, Jesus is walking beside the Sea of Galilee, and he sees Peter and Andrew fishing. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, and Jesus says, Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And what happened? They immediately left their nets. And there's where I get the first point of the message today. They left their nets and they followed Him. They left their nets. One way we can know that we're following Jesus is if we are constantly fishing for people. Can I hear one amen? How do I know I'm a Christian? How do I know I'm following Jesus, Brother Dale? If you're following Jesus, Jesus wants you to be fishing. Not fishing for fish, but fishing for people. Fish smell fishy. I won't go any further. If we're not trying to win our friends and associates to Jesus, we possibly are not really following Him at all. So after their meeting with Jesus, Simon, Peter, and Andrew returned to fishing. But now Jesus calls Peter to leave his nets and follow Him as a full-time disciple as a full-time disciple. And that's the problem that we have in many church circles today. We got a lot of part-time Christians. I preached a message one time. I was talking about guard duty, and I was talking about how uh, I titled the message, Weekend Warriors. And, you know, we got a lot of people that they're good to go on Sunday. Praise the Lord, Pastor, I can shout with the best of them, but on Monday they can cuss with the best of them too, and that don't really fly in God's category. If we're going to be disciples, we need to be full-time disciples. You don't punch a time card when you go out the door back there. When you clock into Jesus, it needs to be 24-7. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we need to be doing it for the Lord as unto the Lord everything we do. So whenever we follow Jesus, Jesus, there are always nets that need to be left behind. Those nets are whatever holds us back from being fully committed followers of Jesus Christ. And I ask you tonight, what is it, if you're listening, that are, those of you that are here, I know that most all of you, I'm not sure what's inside you, but I believe you're here on Wednesday night. That's a pretty good indicator that you're a full-time disciple of the Lord. But we may have somebody, we may have somebody on Facebook that's just a part-time Christian. And if you are a part-time Christian, what is it? What are the nets that are holding you back? Our nets can be our habits, our hang-ups, our friends, our plans, or anything that keeps us from following Him. You know, the Word teaches, and I can give you the Scripture if you need them afterwards, but if we're not putting the Lord first, then we're into idolatry. 
there's something that stands between us and God. And if we profess that we're a Christian and put something between us and God, then all of a sudden we're switching our allegiance from God who wants to be number one. And He's always said, put no other gods before me. He said that to the Israelites. And they stayed in trouble all the time because they carried those little gods in their back pocket. They put them in the, in the camel bags. They got in trouble. They hid them in the tents. And people got killed because God wouldn't put up with it. But they never learned. And neither do we. And you say, Brother Dale, we don't worship gold and silver and calves and, and, and little Buddha men. We don't worship them things. But oh, how much do we worship? And what do we worship? The Word says some people worship their own belly. I'm not going to get into that because I don't want to be crucified before I get home. But you know what? I found out that it's real easy to let your belly become your God. During Christmas time, and I'm going to tell on myself, and y'all want to tell on yourself, just tell us sometime later. I'll listen to you. But I'll tell on myself. During Christmas time, up leading to Christmas time, and through Christmas, and just after Christmas, I got noticing something. I told Teresa, I said, I don't want to go to bed without something sweet. It was ice cream, or it was a piece of cake, or it was raiding the... the, the the apples, the candied apple things. It was, I was trying to find something in the house that was sweet. I even found some stuff that she had froze in the freezer. I was like a scavenger. I'd go, I, but you know what? The Lord got a hold of me. And, and I got to learning that I was addicted to sugar. You say, Pastor, how can that happen? It was easy. I like it, and it likes me, because it sticks right close. So what I do about it? The 1st of January, I said, okay, 21 days, no sugar. Boy, that was hard. My goodness, I was craving. I thought, I can't sleep, but devil, I'm going to pray. If you keep me awake, I'm going to pray and heap coals on your head. I'm going to pray and pray. After about six, seven days, I didn't worry about the sugar no more. I didn't have an urging. I went to bed, lay down on the bed, went to sleep like a baby. What are you saying? I'm saying that God will give you victory if you'll make a decision. But we cannot have other gods before Him. They become an idol. They become a net. They become something that holds us back. You say, Pastor, can sugar hold you back? I don't know, but I do know one thing. It was working on me. My joints got so stiff, I couldn't hardly move. And I got studying, and when I got studying, I found out that sugar is a big problem with inflammation. Hallelujah. I knew that would preach. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So if the Lord starts convicting us, what are we going to do? Our nets can be habits. I'll go over them again. Or friends. You got any friends that hold you back? Do you really need to go to church today? Why don't we just go to the mountains? You really need to do this. Why don't we just go do that? If somebody's not leading you toward the Lord, they'll lead you away from the Lord. And that becomes a net in your life, holding you back from what you could be doing for the Lord. It's 8.08, and I'm fixing to hit point number two. But to become a great disciple, we must first leave our nets behind, and then number two, I believe that we need to make sure that we understand the divinity of Jesus Christ. Do we understand? I'm not saying that you have to fully, 100%, understand the triune Godhead, because that is a deep subject, and it's very very hard to understand. How do you understand three in one, one in three? All three are God, only one God, but three individual that do individual different things. Some of the folks on the other side of town will tell us that it's all just Jesus. There's no other 
nothing. It's just Jesus and the extensions of Jesus. I'm not lamb blasting them. I'm not coming against their denomination, but I don't understand if it was just Jesus, how Jesus stood in the middle of the Jordan River and the Holy Spirit lit upon Him in the form of a dove and God the Father spoke from heaven. That sounds like three to me. And I believe God's showing us the plan that He has for Christianity, for the Christian. So, we must believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. It is a necessity for us to be a good disciple. And I want to look at it. Peter, along with the other eleven, traveled with Jesus, and they learned from Him for about two years of Jesus' three-year ministry. Peter and James and John formed the inner circle of, of the selected disciples. We know that. It's Scripture. I'm not giving you my opinion tonight. We know that as facts. These three alone are allowed to occupy Jesus into the house when He raises Jairus' daughter in Luke chapter 8 and be the closest to Him during His prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane in Mark chapter 14, verse 33. One day Jesus tells His disciples that some of them will not die before they see the kingdom of God. Has that ever twisted you up? Has that scripture ever twisted you up? It's in Luke chapter 9, verse number 27. When Jesus looked at His disciples and He said, Some of you are not going to die till you see the kingdom. He was telling the truth, and I'm fixing to read it to you here just in a minute. Eight days later, after that statement was made, Jesus took His inner circle, Peter, James, and John, to a mountain to pray. Now, some of the people in the church world today say that Jesus has no favorites, that everybody is all treated completely equal. Well, I don't know what you're going to do with this Scripture, but the Lord pulls people out based upon their love for Him, number one, and their de devoting devotion to Him, number two, how much of their life is devoted to Him, and then number three, the Lord knows the end from the beginning. He knows what your potential is and what you shall be. So if you're going to say that He chooses individuals, He does that because it's best for the kingdom and it's best for the individual. But let's look here at what happened eight days later. Is in Luke chapter 9. I'm going to read several scriptures, and i got to do it in a hurry. Now it came to pass, verse 28, about eight days after these sayings, that he took Peter, John, and James, and went up to a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory, and the two men who stood with him, him. Then it happened, as they were parting from him, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles. Let's just build three churches while we're here, Jesus. Yeah, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Poor old Peter, he always engaged his mouth before he put his brain in gear, right? He always spoke from the mouth first. And then verse number 34, while he was saying this, and here comes another voice from the clouds. A cloud came over, overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone, but they kept quiet and told no one in those days of any of the things they had seen. That's verse 36. Now, let's talk about that. Jesus is transformed before their eyes into His divine glory. This is what is called the Shekinah glory of God. Then the two Old Testament saints, Moses and Elijah, or Elias, if you want to look at it that way, appeared in glorious splendor and talked with Jesus. Both of these Old Testament saints also had their own miraculous experiences with God on a mountain. One on Mount Sinai and the other on Mount Carmel. These two men represent all the work done to prepare for the Messiah. Moses represented the law. Why did God 
through Jesus, talk to these two men. I'm fixing to tell you right here it is. It's plain. It's hard to understand, but it's plain when you do understand it. Moses represents the law which reveals our sin, and Elijah represents the prophets who foretold of the coming of the Savior. They talk about the event for which all the Old Testament saints have waited. Did you notice there that we said in Scriptures as we read it, they talked about His death. They talked about His sacrifice. They talked about it. Did you know that all the Old... I'm about to get happy here, but all the Old Testament saints, they look forward to that time. They all look forward to a time that when a Messiah would come that would pay for the sins of the whole world. And He came, Elijah and Moses, they looked forward to... To that time, Moses by the law, Elijah by the prophets, and the prophets testified and prophesied that he would come, and it was all foretold just exactly like it happened. And here we are, some 2,020 something years later, and we look back this way and we say, Praise God, it happened. It happened. But there's something else that we get to look at. As long as we look back and realize, Yes, he did it, and we believe that he did it, we believe just like they did that he would do it. But then when he did it, we believe in that, and he said, That's not all I'm going to do I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come again Woo, man what evidence that we have and people say it takes a lot of faith to believe in God it takes more faith to be an antagonistic infidel that don't believe in God than it does to believe in God that's negative faith but it takes more of that two of the Old Testament saints are very excited because Moses had waited over 1,400 years. Elijah had waited over 800 years for the coming of the Messiah. Jesus was apparently been praying a long time because Peter, James, and John have fallen asleep. However, this dazzling glory awakens them. When Moses and Elijah are about to leave, Peter, whose dominant characteristic is impulsiveness, He reminds me of me, by the way. I fit real good in Peter's pocket. Whose dominant characteristic is impulsiveness, he asked Jesus to let them build three shrines, one for him, Moses, and Elijah. With this request, Peter flunks the test of knowing Jesus' true identity. We have to know the divinity of Jesus. It is so important. Peter failed it that day. As Peter is speaking, a cloud appears. The three disciples become afraid as it envelops them. This is the same cloud that guided the Israelites in the wilderness. Then again later at the completion of Solomon's temple, the cloud was so thick that kept the priests from from doing their duties, from performing their duties. The cloud is the symbol of God's presence because a cloud cannot be contained. Are you listening to me tonight? A cloud can't be contained. God is omnipresent, which means He's everywhere at one time. God, God's being permeates all of creation because He is spirit. God chose to contain Himself in a body of flesh and blood for 33 years to provide salvation for all of our sins. Jesus made this clear when He said, Anyone who has seen Me has seen the Father. John 14, 9. Jesus is the great I Am of the Old Testament. He's God's ultimate revelation of Himself. When Jesus was transfigured before His inner circle of disciples, He was saying, I'm God in the flesh and blood. With the cloud comes a voice from heaven. This is the second time God speaks from heaven to say something about His Son Jesus. The first time was at Jesus' baptism. Now let's go back to Peter's request. What was wrong with building three tents or three churches? Building three tents would have put Jesus in the same category as a great human saint. But He is so much more And that's what we got to understand in point number two. Moses was a great lawgiver. Elijah was the greatest of the prophets. But Jesus is the Son of God. 
And we need to understand that. He is God in the flesh. Jesus cannot be put on the same level with even great saints or like Moses and Elijah. After God speaks from heaven, the disciples are left alone with Jesus. Matthew and Mark tell us Jesus orders the disciples not to tell anyone until He's risen from the dead about this experience. To become great disciples of Jesus, we can't believe that He was just a great lawgiver or a teacher like Moses or a great prophet like Elijah. There are many religions tonight that will tell you they believe that Jesus came to earth. They believe in Jesus, but they believe that He was a great teacher. They don't believe that He was the Son of God, that He was God in the flesh, that He was the second person of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We must believe and be willing to acknowledge Jesus is God, come to earth in flesh and blood to die on a cross, for our sins. It's essential, not only for becoming great disciples, but also for going to heaven. Are you listening? If you want to go to heaven, this is a necessity that you must believe. Jesus is, was, always will be the Son of God. How do I know that, Brother Dale? John 8, 23 and 24. And He said to them, You are from beneath, and I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. It's necessary. You see, I'm not telling you something that I just believe. I'm telling you something that's in the Word of God. This is not because of my belief. This is because God said it. And if He said it, it's true and it's real because He is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And so He said, you got to believe that I am the Son of God to get to heaven. Is that clear? Peter wanted to build a tabernacle or a shrine to honor Jesus, but Jesus doesn't want buildings or shrines to honor Him. He wants us to honor Him with our lives, letting Him be Lord or boss over our lives. There's a scripture that says, Know ye not that your body is a temple, a shrine, a building, a holding place of the Holy Spirit. Did you not know that you all contain the Spirit of God and He lives on the inside if you're a Christian? Many humans have buildings or monuments named after them, but Jesus does not fit in that category. Jesus wants us to declare to the world that He is the Son of God who can take away their sin. Describing Himself as a Christian, somebody said, I am nobody telling everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Hallelujah. I like that so much, I'm going to say it again. Describing himself as a Christian, somebody said, I believe there's a song written about that, I am nobody telling everybody about somebody who can save anybody. That's a wonderful description of what it means to be a great disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So to be a great disciple, we got to leave our nets, got to leave our nets, and we must believe in Jesus' divinity. And then number three, and the last point tonight, I've got eight minutes to get it out. We must practice limitless forgiveness. And that is a hard one. I saved the hard one for last. I'm telling you the truth, that is a hard one. But to be a great disciple, it's one that we must learn to do. We may be learning this one until Jesus takes us home, but we better be in the process of trying. Are you hearing me? Peter went right up to the very end of Jesus' life and failed again when he cut a man's ear off and he felt like he was doing the right thing. But he wasn't doing the right thing. So it's necessary for us, no matter how old or young that we are, to always be open for learning to be taught, to be growing in Christ. We must practice limitless forgiveness. One day Peter asked Jesus. See, Peter, and I'm reading between the lines here, but I can just see Peter. Somebody been pushing his buttons. Yeah, somebody been pushing his buttons. I don't know what it was. They may have killed his dog or, you know, done something, throwed eggs against his house. Somebody was pushing Peter's buttons. And he asked the Lord, he said, Lord... How many times must I forgive someone who sins against me? 
And then he suggests in Matthew 18, 21, he said, Lord, is it okay for seven times? He was looking forward to the eighth time is what Peter was doing. He was getting ready. I can see him clenching his fist already or pulling out his sword. He is fixing to do damage, and he felt like he was going to do it with authority because he doesn't forgive them seven times. But here comes the eighth one. The rabbis of that day taught three times was sufficient. Did you know that? Back in this day, that was acceptable. The rabbis, you just have to forgive three times. But Peter suggests, I'll go a little further. I'll go to seven times. Perhaps this is because the number often used in the Bible promotes or signifies completeness, the number seven. So Peter is now growing as a disciple. He went from three to seven, (laughs) but still needs Jesus to do some more chipping on his diamond in the rough. Peter doesn't anticipate Jesus' divine arithmetic. Listen to this. Matthew 18, 22, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times times seven. Can't you see the steam come out of Peter's ear when he heard that? There went his opportunity. This means there's no limit on forgiveness. Therefore, there is never a reason to hold a grudge or to become bitter against anyone. You say, Brother Dale, you wouldn't say that if you knew what they did to me. Listen to me. You don't have to forget it, but you do have to forgive it. You don't have to be a doormat but you do have to forgive it. If you don't forgive it, it's serious business. And I'm going to explain it in a minute. To illustrate the importance of a forgiving spirit, Jesus tells the parable of an unforgiving debtor. He says a servant, and you know the story, I'm not going to spend the time on it, but this servant, uh, about to be sold for his debt, successfully begs for mercy from his master, to whom he owns a staggering 10,000 talents. Then the servant, his master forgives him, but this servant that got forgiven goes out, and he finds somebody that owes him some, just a handful, and he has him thrown in prison till he owes, he pays everything. So then basically what the Lord is saying is this dude, first of all, gets life in prison because he'll never be able to pay back the loan. This parable teaches us that our unwillingness to forgive, not just a few times, but without limit, has serious consequences both now and in eternity. Matthew 6, 15, But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespass. That's pretty deep stuff right there. You say, Brother Dale, I believe that once I'm saved, I'm always saved. I never have to worry about anything else. That scripture right there don't sound like that to me. That scripture right there says, even after you're saved, even after you become a disciple, even after you start following after the Lord and somebody does something mean to you and you don't forgive them, you're going to lose your forgiveness. What does that mean? That means if you ain't forgiven, you don't get to heaven. No sin gets into heaven. That's the way I look at it. That's the way I preach it. I believe that we need to make sure that we're forgiving people constantly. So this parable teaches that our willingness to forgive is a necessity. In this parable, Jesus is teaching us if we really appreciate God's love and forgiveness, we'll be willing to forgive other people. Few things reveal that we are great disciples of Jesus like our willingness to forgive. Limitless forgiveness is difficult, but if Jesus is really the Lord of our lives, we will do it. Now let me clarify something that I said just a moment ago. If you are trying to forgive, I believe that's another matter rather than letting hate from unforgiveness build in your heart. I don't believe that God is pleased with somebody that stops trying to forgive. There are things that happen, and I'll give you a for instance. Joy and her brother went through a tremendous lick when that drunk driver killed their other brother. 
And it was very, very hard to forgive that situation. But they were trying. And eventually the forgiveness came. And Joy was able, and her brother Aaron was able to talk to this person and offer that forgiveness. It came because God's grace is sufficient. Now, if they had passed away, Joy or Aaron, in the process of this forgiveness, I don't believe they would have been lost because of that, because they were trying to work toward that. I'm talking about people who replace their experience with God and turn their life into a period of hate for something that an individual did. I don't believe that they can make it to heaven that way. There has to be forgiveness or the Word of God would not say what it says. God won't forgive you if you don't forgive others. So it's uh, 29, 829. Few things reveal that we're great disciples as much as us being willing to forgive. Practicing limitless forgiveness doesn't mean that we are people and we let people take advantage of us or use us like a doormat. It means that we will not let them take make us hold grudges and cause us to become bitter and turn bitterness into hatred. To be great disciples, we must practice limitless forgiveness. Last scripture tonight, Colossians 3, 12 and 13. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against other, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. That's a command. It's not, a, it's not an idea. It's not a suggestion. It is a command. And that's what the Lord's saying that we must do. So, as ending up tonight, living under the influence How do we become better disciples? How do we get to the point to where we're living more in unison with the Lord? How can we be a person that's right under the Lord's arm? I mean, right under His arm, doing what He's called us to do. We've got to leave our nets behind. We've got to believe in Jesus' divinity. And that's simply a big word for saying that Jesus is God's Son, the second person of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three are God, but three different personalities. One God, if you know one, you know them all. That's what Jesus said. And then number three, we got to practice limitless forgiveness. Woo! It's 831. Would you stand with me tonight? Praise the Lord. That was a lot to say to get it done. Father, we love you with all of our hearts. We appreciate you. Thank you for this time you've given us this evening together. I pray that you'll bless your people. You've blessed them coming in. Now bless them going out. Use us, God, as your disciples. Let us grow into being more like you. Let us be influencers, God, living under the influence, completely living under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Please take over our lives, God. We surrender. God, let us get up every morning and say, Holy Spirit, I surrender today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing, O God, in Your sight, my Lord and my Savior, my Rock, my Redeemer. We love You, Jesus. We ask You these things in that precious name that's above every name, Jesus of Nazareth. Keep us in Your plan. And everybody said, Amen. If anybody needs special prayer tonight, I invite you to come. Otherwise, go with God and He'll always go with you. I love you, church. Thank you for coming on Wednesday night. Praise the Lord.